Long ago, humans realized that living things are made of cells. Moving, replicating blobs of water which, when arranged just right, produce a bigger blob that moves and replicates and makes YouTube videos. And then a biologist boarded a boat called the Beagle to better understand the beaks of birds. He noticed that islands rich with seeds were home to short-beaked birds, and where fish were far and wide, so too were beaks. And since birds don't change beaks like humans and hats, he had discovered natural selection. But this study of how incredible living organisms emerge from very simple, microscopic things is really a story of economics. Wherever resources are limited, the same basic laws apply, whether in ants, plants, or Fortune 500 companies. Living organisms are running economic simulations that can help answer some of our biggest questions. This is the biology of business. The goal of a business, like any organism, is to stay alive. Yet, they'll set up camp even in the darkest, dirtiest places. So why live in the extreme cold? And why buy and sell human organs when there's easier money to be made? Because economic laws make these places desirable. If there are too many penguins, they starve and recover until a sustainable number is reached. In extreme environments, that number is very low. So it might suck to live in the Antarctic, but there's so little competition that it's worth adapting. And as long as there's demand for corrupt and distasteful services, so too will businesses be willing to provide them. That's because prices naturally rise until someone will make a deal, and someone always will. And in every environment, organisms have different strategies for survival. Rats and mice are really just genetic batons, passing on their genes as quickly as possible to many children. No need for private rat school, they play the numbers game, betting that at least one will be successful. Elephants prefer to invest in just a few children, which they gestate for nearly two years. And companies are no different. Many see Amazon as disorganized, this week announcing a phone designed for no one, and next a button for buying Pop-Tarts. And others think Apple is too slow at entering markets and adding features, putting their eggs in so few baskets. But these aren't failures of management, just different strategies for survival. Amazon takes the mouse approach of trying a bunch of products and hopes that some will succeed. Apple is the elephant, investing very heavily in only a few products, which are late to enter the market. But surely not all strategies are equally efficient, so which organism will win the game of evolution? And what does the perfect business look like? Well, there's no finale to evolution because as the environment changes, so too does natural selection. And the features that make a good species in one environment are detrimental in another. There will probably never be a single, all-powerful, by and large corporation because different markets require different adaptations. It's easy to think of evolution as a force that needs no controlling, that better businesses and species will thrive naturally. But evolution is blind to all but one fact. Does this gene increase or decrease the chance that its host will reproduce? It doesn't know if it also hurts the group as a whole. Irish elk are a good example. Bigger antlers attracted more mates, which began an evolutionary arms race of all antlers getting bigger. But what evolution didn't know was how much of a burden these huge antlers would become. Every elk would be better better off if all their antlers were half as big, but no individual elk could do so and still find a mate. Likewise, market forces can shape businesses in a way that hurts everyone, but no individual business could resist and stay competitive. All of this means that you are guided by markets like ants are guided by evolution. But it also means we have millions of accidental economic experiments in nature, just waiting to be explored. As much as I love reading, I'm always frustrated by how little content can be in such a large book. Authors are pressured to write longer books, so they take their ideas and add as much fluff as possible. And even a shorter book can be hard to get through if you're a busy person. But this video is sponsored by Blinkist, an app that takes the key insights of thousands of nonfiction books and condenses them into a few minutes reading or listening. It's like hiring someone to read books for you and report back what's important whenever you're ready. In the time it takes to read one full book, you could be getting all the important parts of many. And my favorite part is that Blinkist doesn't make you pay for each book. A single subscription gives you access to as many books as you want. If you're already a heavy reader, Blinkist is a great way to browse a book before committing to it. And in case you're not sure where to start, let me recommend So You've Been Publicly Shamed by John Ronson. Go to Blinkist.com polymatter to make 2018 the year you read more. You can get 20% off your first year or try it completely free if you're not sure.